Good morning, church. I invite us to take a moment and get settled in together as we begin our worship time. I'd like to welcome you, whether you are here in person or joining us on our live stream this morning. Welcome to this opportunity to come together in worship. The United Methodist Church outside the walls in the glory of God's realm. We give our thanks for the ability to be here together. We ask us to take just a moment to center ourselves in a contemplative prayer. A time when we remember that we are being drawn away from the ways of the world and closer to the ways of God. Let's take just a moment of prayer. invite you if you're able to rise for our call to worship. God fashions human beings by taking hold of the dirt of the earth, holding it so close that the dirt can share in the divine breath of God. God's breath inspires the dirt with the freshness of life. 
It is only when the dirt has been suffused with God's intimate breath that life becomes possible. The trees, the critters, the birds, the insects, all that lives is made possible by the breath of God giving life to the dirt. If you're able to remain standing, I invite you to do so for our first hymn, The Church's One Foundation. You'll see the music as an insert in the bulletin. I invite you to join your voices with ours loudly and passionately. <laughs> to share prayer requests. If you shout them out, I will repeat them from up here so everybody can hear them. But are there any folks that would like to share some prayer requests this morning? Yes? Um, prayers for my husband Bruce, who's having um, heart surgery on Wednesday. I invite to keep Bruce, Bruce in our prayers for heart surgery on Thursday, you said? Wednesday. Wednesday. And we are, as a family, in the process of moving his mother, Louise, who is now seven years old, from Independent living to assisted living at place, and that is happening tomorrow. And prayers for the moving of Louise. Yes. Prayers for my mom. One of my great nieces, and I'm going to her, it's 
In her first semester freshman year, she just flew to Spain yesterday for spending her whole first semester freshman year in Spain. So I just want to thank God her a lot and I just ask for prayer. Amen. I'm going to keep our prayers for that first semester in Spain. Yes. Prayers and their loss. Yes. Prayers for the son-in-law. Prayers Prayers for the Oakley family. Those at Elm Park uh, would have known Nancy Nichols Oakley. Uh, her husband Dick passed away this uh, last Wednesday. Prayers for the Oakley family. I'm also going to encourage us to keep the college faculty and students in our prayers as they gear up for what will inevitably be a wonderful and successful year. Let us keep them all in our prayers. I invite us to keep Ava, Jesse, and Chris in our prayers with their tragic loss this past week. I'm also going to invite us to offer some prayers of celebration. Wendy's grandson, Victor, has been born unto the world just recently. Let us keep Victor, Victor's parents, Victor's whole family in our prayers as he discovers the amazing world that he has been born into. We invite us to be an hour to a prayer with one another. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers that we have offered. You have heard the prayers that we have spoken for the ones we love, the people we care for, the people who have been placed in this world closest to us. Lord, we celebrate with them in new birth. We struggle with them in the midst of changing life statuses. We mourn and grieve with them in the face of loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, we come to something that feels Somewhat like the end of the summer season, as we join together in the beauty of nature here in Wilbur Park, we are on the verge of this new beginning for so many. New beginnings in school, new beginnings in careers and in life, some traveling far from home, some staying nearby. But Lord, in this season of new beginnings, we lift prayer to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, you have heard our voices. But you also hear those prayers that we carry deep within ourselves. Those things we don't share out loud. Those things that tie us up and drag us down, and we don't let anyone else in to help them. Lord, hear all the prayers this morning that go unspoken. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And Lord, as always, we keep the state of our world in our prayers. We recognize the damaging effects of climate change with droughts and fires. We recognize the devastating affairs that bring violence into our communities through anger and loneliness, despair, hopelessness. Lord, for all the places where our world is struggling, we are lifting prayer to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now I invite us to join our voices together in our unison prayer. You'll find it printed in the bulletin. I invite you to share it together. We have been blessed to live out our days amidst God's handiwork. As we gather beneath the blue sky, 
among the trees and bird song, we acknowledge that we have been blessed to live in a world created by divine hands. Everywhere we look, we see evidence of creative love. We live in such a small part of what God created. A single world in the vastness of the universe. Yet it is this world that we have been charged with caring for. This garden we name as Earth that we have been called to tend. Lord, even as we worship today, remind us of our responsibility of care for this world. To care for one another. And to care for ourselves in love and gracious. And now, as forgiven and reconciled children of God, we pray. Our Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite those who are young or young at heart to join me up front for just a minute or two. What happened? <laughs> Where did you come from? All right. Uh, I got a very important question this morning. Do you know what it means to use your indoor voice? Do you know what that means? That means you're supposed to be quiet! Is that very fun? No! So what's it mean to use your outdoor voice? No, outdoor voice! Outdoor voice is loud, right? Sometimes it's as loud as we can be! So, when we are together in church, which voice are we supposed to use? Are we supposed to use our indoor voice or our outdoor voice? Hmm. I think today is a good day to use our outdoor voice in church. This is our picnic church day! So, I want your help. I want you to use your outdoor voice with me and I want you to say two words. Can you do that? They're going to be praise and God. And you're going to use your outdoor voice, right? Outdoor voice, I'll do it with you, right? Ready? Praise God! Yeah, yeah come on! Try again. Praise God! Alright, how we train with our indoors? Maybe that'll be better. Maybe. Praise God! Alright, we'll work on that one. But there are always times when we are called to just shout out how great God has been to us. So even sometimes when we're supposed to use our indoor voices, we can do that too. We may have to be a little quieter, but we are always encouraged let everyone know just how great God has been to us. All right, let's pray together. Lord God, I give you thanks that when we are indoors and when we are outdoors, when we are playing and when we are worshiping and when we are having our picnic together, we always have the opportunity to shout out, sometimes loud, sometimes quietly, but we get to shout out how wonderful you are to us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, All right, let's just say some time with me. <laughs> let's share the peace of Christ with one another. <laughs>
All right, people, settle down. <laughs> Time to do scripture now. I'm going to use my outdoor voice. <laughs> An epistle reading from Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given each of us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching, the encourager in encouragement. The giver in sincerity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. And now there's a hymn, right? Right, there is a There is an insert for the hymns if you want to turn to Built on the Rock.
Now, my rule that is hard to get up and down out of these canvas chairs. <laughs> if you stay seated, just rise for the gospel in your heart. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So we have a tradition in the church where outgoing pastors leave a stole for the incoming pastor to put on a symbolic way of putting on the mantle of leadership in the church. The time-honored tradition, um, very full of history in the church, tradition in the church. But I gotta tell you, that is not the moment when I feel I have taken on the mantle of the church. I'll tell you when it happens. It's when somebody comes to you with a key ring and says, here's the keys. Karen did that for me just a couple of months ago. Here's your keys. That's nicely labeled, too. Except one, there's a, a skeleton key in there that had no label on it. So I had to rack my brain to remember where he told me that key went to. I finally remembered it yesterday. But there's that moment when you receive those keys and it becomes real. Because there's a lot of work when we do the transitions in churches, but it's that moment when it's almost as if the community is saying, we trust you enough to let you into our building. You don't need to ask permission to walk in anymore. We trust you enough just to walk in because you are gonna be the one to be leading us to where we're going. First two churches I served I think there was one key for each of them. Second two churches, there were two keys. Third church, there were three. And now I have this huge key ring that I you know, hide in my office because God knows I am not carrying that thing around with me. <laughs> I trained my belt just a little bit so they don't fall off when I put them on my, uh, my carabiner that I carry with me. But I kind of wonder, what must it have been feeling like for Peter when Jesus says, I am giving you the keys of the kingdom? Good Lord, I am terrified I'm going to lock my keys in somewhere or forget to lock a door somewhere and I'm going to get in so much trouble because I did something wrong with these keys to this one building that I have been charged with. What must Peter have felt like when Jesus said to him, I give you the keys to the kingdom? What an amazing responsibility that I would absolutely hate to have. I don't know about anybody else, but I have enough trouble remembering to lock my door when I leave, much less being charged with the care of the kingdom. I gotta tell you, there's some times when I feel like I know exactly how Peter feels. There are some times in my life when I'm like, yeah, I'd probably have done the exact same thing Peter just did. Remember just a couple of weeks ago in the lectionary, we had that text when Peter jumps out on the boat because he loves Jesus so much. He wants to be so close to Jesus. And then he starts walking over on the water to Jesus. He starts to sink. I, I, I kind of feel like I might know what that feels like. Trusting and loving in something so much that, you know, jump out without even thinking about it. 
and all of a sudden the terror arrives and I start to notice I'm sinking and I don't know how to save myself. That I understand. I understand that feeling. But there are some things Peter does that I just, not my nature. So Jesus and the disciples arrive in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks the question, who do people say that I am? And the disciples all chime up with an answer, right? Some say you're one of the great old prophets. Some say you're John the Baptist. We don't know exactly, but people are saying you're one of the great ones. And then Jesus does the thing. Asks the question that I think I would have been terrified to answer. He asks the question, who do you say that I am? I have enough trouble when the waitress asks me if I want super salad. <laughs> Having Jesus Christ ask me, who do you say that I am? I couldn't do that. I would clam up. I would be terrified to give the wrong answer. But Peter stands up, strains out his tunic, says, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. All the hopes, all the dreams, they rest on you. And that's when Jesus says, you got it right, Peter. You said the exact right thing. And I think part of what Peter gets right is he says it in the right place. Because it's easy for us to say that when it doesn't matter. But I'm going to tell you where Peter says this, because this changes the story entirely. Peter says this in the region of Caesarea Philippi. If you don't know what Caesarea Philippi looks like, I don't blame you. It's a little ways from here. But imagine a great stone cliff. And built into that cliff are temples dedicated to the gods, dedicated to the emperors. They're standing in the midst of this great building project in the side of this stone cliff. This project that says the old gods are amazing. And the emperors, the rulers are amazing. They are our leaders. They are the ones that we trust. They are the ones that we go to with all our problems. And it's almost like Peter says, you see that greatness standing behind us? You see that stone face with these beautiful temples carved into it? All of that is hogwash. None of that matters. Those temples, that cliffside, all of it will disappear one day. The living God is with us right now. Jesus Christ is with us right now. That's who we're here for. That's what we're doing. And in the midst of that shrine to the way the world always worked, Peter says, there's a different way. There's the way of Christ. And Jesus says, congratulations, Peter, you said it right. You said exactly what needed to be said, and you said it in a place where it was hard to say that. Surrounded by all the signs and evidence of the power of the empire, you identified the true power in the world, the presence of God with us. That is the foundation on which Christ says the church is built. Not on the stonework that they were looking at, not on the beautiful temples, but on the community that was being formed in that moment. They called it the Ecclesia, the gathered assembly of people. That was the foundation that God was building on. Now, if I was building, I would use something sturdier than people because people will let us down. 
I would use something like rock to build on. That That's pretty sturdy. But then again, I would probably also choose a Messiah who didn't go to the cross. I would choose a God who never showed weakness. But in that particular moment, in the midst of all the human vulnerability, Jesus says, this is what's important. This community that you're forming together, we are part of that community. We today, this gathered assembly, this is the foundation on which Jesus Christ is building something in the world today. And look at yourself right now, or look at your neighbor right now. It's hard to look at yourself and you'll have a mirror around. Look at your neighbor right now. Notice all the ways that your neighbor has screwed up this past week or this past year. Make a list of all those ways that the person sitting right next to you maybe has let you down from time to time and realize that Jesus Christ was okay with that because this was a foundation of community. And no matter how many times the individuals in a community may screw up, let us down, when we strive together, when we work together, when we live together, when we grow together, my God, what we can do together. What a gift we have been given. That our foundation of faith is built not on something that wears away with time, but on something that grows continuously. In Caesarea Philippi, there was that great cliff face. It's still there. After the 1960s, the war in the 1960s, there are many people that still live in that area. But the great cliff face is still there. But it is being slowly worn away. It was formed by a spring in that area. That's why people lived there, because there was that spring in the area. But that same spring that brought people to live there is slowly wearing this cliff away. One day it will be no more. But the community that Christ established so long ago, the community that we are still a part of, cannot be washed away, cannot be eroded with time, can only grow stronger and stronger the more we dedicate ourselves to it. I titled this message, The Day Peter Got It Right. And this is the first of a kind of two-part message. Next part I'm going to be sharing next week at first. Today is the day Peter got it right. But we also know that there's the day that Peter got it wrong. Oddly enough, they happen the same exact day. Because Jesus is going to go from handing Peter the keys to the kingdom to saying, get thee behind me, Satan, while looking Peter straight in the eye. There are days that we're all going to get it right. And there are going to be days when we get it wrong. There are going to be days when we glorify God with our outdoor voice. And there are going to be days when our terror, our fear, our insecurity keeps us from living fully who we are. But by the grace of God, the days we get it wrong are simply opportunities for us to grow so that we have more days of getting it right. And thank God that Peter got it right before he got it wrong. Let's be in prayer together. Most gracious and merciful God, we are coming to you as a community filled with imperfections. We are coming as a community that doesn't always do the right thing, doesn't always say the right thing, doesn't always know the right way to go at every given moment, but we are a community striving together, and what could be more glorious than that? That we strive together, that we struggle together, that we learn together, and that we grow together. But Lord, isn't that the foundation that our church is built on? The togetherness of our community. I give you thanks and praise, O oh God. Amen. 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 The gifts that we give to God.
The ways that we give back are not limited to what we offer on Sunday morning. The gifts that we give back to God are uncounted throughout the week. We give of our time and our talent. We give of our dedication. Just this morning, we had people giving of themselves to make this worship possible. At this very moment, we have people giving of themselves so that the picnic that is coming right after this worship is possible. There are so many ways that we are called to give back. Right now, we're going to collect the Sunday morning offering as just one of the many ways we are called to give to the community of Christ. Let's collect this morning's offering. of prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that we can do things right. And thank you, God, that we can screw up and be forgiven. Thank you, God, that we can receive. Thank you, God, that we can give. For, Lord, we have received many gifts some as individuals, some as a community of faith, we have received many gifts. Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to give back, to give into ministry, to further the mission of the Methodist Church, the Church Universal, the Church of Christ throughout the world. Lord, bless our giving this morning. Bless the gifts that we have given. Bless the gifts that we are giving throughout the week. Use them, multiply them, and let us be inspired by them. That we may become a people built on giving of ourselves. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Our final hymn this morning is Christ for the World We Sing. It is an insert in the bulletin. Stand if you want, sit if you want, whatever's most comfortable for you.
announcements they would like to share this morning. If you do, I invite you to either shout them out and I can repeat them, or I invite you to come up to the microphone up here. Any announcements to share this morning? Then I would invite us, well, before I invite us to do anything, I want to thank Randy, Paul, and John for the work they have done setting up this morning. All of those who showed up early to help set up tables and everything, just raise your hand for me. There's so many more than that that aren't raising their hands right now. Give them thanks. I am pretty sure that if you see somebody get into a Subaru after church today, they were here early helping set up because they're all <laughs> right around here. <laughs> all of you who helped share food this morning, I want to thank all of you for helping make this picnic that is about to come possible because we can't do any of this without all hands working together. What a testament to being that community striving together, that we work together, we worship together, we play together, we celebrate together. Let us now, we're not going forth anywhere, we're going to stick around right here and have our picnic together, but we are going to go into the world from this place. We're going to go into our homes, into our workplaces, into our playgrounds, into our department stores and grocery stores. We are going to go into the world, not as individuals anymore, but remind ourselves that we go as a community. Even when we're not gathered as a church community, we are a community formed by Christ for our mission in the world. Not only to make disciples of Jesus Christ, but to transform the world together. Let us be in the world, the community of Christ, ready to change the world for the glory of Christ. Let's go in peace. Amen. Amen.